Welcome to the Millennium Counseling Center podcast, where hope is yours, it's time to soar. I'm your host, Oren Madison. It's time to rise above and celebrate healing, hope, and recovery with the Millennium Counseling Center team. Special thanks to Kaz Source, who helps us with the production of our podcast. If anybody needs any help or looking into podcasts, please reach out to Kaz Source at kazcontent.com. Good afternoon, and welcome to this edition of the Society of Financial Services Professionals Zoom meeting. My name is Pierce Ward. I'm the chapter president. Today, we have a special guest speaker talking about a subject that's been lurking beneath the surface in the lives of many of us uh, who have been struggling with the lockdown, mental health during COVID and turbulent times. Our speaker today is Derek Bielsma, who is the executive director of Millennial Counseling Center in Chicago, Illinois. He's gonna spend some time with us unpacking where we are with this issue today. Um, he is a licensed clinical professional counselor and is nationally board certified in counseling. Derek has got several podcasts as well as radio broadcasts on issues surrounding mental health. He has a deep resume of academic achievement that uh, is longer than I want to go into here uh, because I'm stealing enough of his time on a valuable subject. Um, as always, if you have any questions, we are monitoring uh, your questions in the chat box. You can also raise your hand and we can accommodate you. Uh, you know, I guess, Derek, it's up to you about raising hand and stopping, that kind of stuff. If you have a question, raise your hand or put something in the chat box and we will get to it as soon as we can. So without, uh, I guess, further ado, Derek, uh, you have the floor. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate you guys having me on. And yeah, if people have questions uh, kind of while we're talking and uh, if, uh, if Pierce, you wanna, you know, kind of just jump in and let me know what those are. You know, I, I wanna make sure people don't kind of lose their, train of thought as I talk about these different things, but feel free to uh, ask questions and then we'll also have questions at the end uh, in case people have questions. So we'll again, my name is Derek Bilsma. I'm a uh, licensed professional counselor. I'm also a, one of the, well, the executive director and one of the owners of a group uh, counseling practice in Chicago, Illinois. And we do individual counseling, group counseling, and we also have an intensive program for people who need kind of a higher level of care. And then we also have a specific division that we work uh, with athletes, uh, specifically for athletes, which is another place where there's been a high need. So uh, I've been, this is a second career for me. I previously owned and operated recruiting and staffing firms. So I was in the business world for a number of years. And uh, then I went back and got my master's in my mid thirties, about 15, uh, 17 years ago. And, uh, and decided to, that this is the area that I wanted to be in. And it's uh, one of the best decisions I've ever made. I think that the being in the helping profession was something that I really had passionate for, so or passion for. So, just want to uh, talk about. Obviously, this subject is a big one, and it's something that has gained a lot of traction throughout COVID. Uh, some of the things that we'll hit on is, you know, kind of mental health during COVID, some of the financial stressors that that's caused, uh, how you what you may see, and and how to handle things with your clients. Uh, of course, we've got the 24-hour news cycle and politics. And then personally, uh, how has this affected us and what are some things you can do that'll be helpful for you and what are some things you can do that you can uh, be helpful to your clients or to your family? Uh, this has been, you know, probably in modern times, the greatest mental health crisis we've had. Uh, the last 18 to 20 months have been really brutal for uh, not just those who were previously suffering from mental health issues, but for people who had never experienced it before, for people who didn't know what anxiety felt like or depression felt like uh, or what, you know, or had any issues with substance use or abuse. So these are some major areas that have been uh, highly affected. And there's a, you know, kind of a, a list of things that we'll go through some different subjects. That, as I said, feel free to, uh, you know, kind of jump in. One of the things I wanted to talk about is there was a, a Forbes article that came out, uh, which was got a lot of attention and got a lot of press. And this was probably uh, six or eight months into, uh, into COVID. And uh, the reason I bring it up is because it listed uh, a number of different statistics at the time that uh, were brought from the CDC and surveys and, and you know, kind of uh, scientific peer reviewed uh, uh, sources so that they, 
you know, were valid. And uh, I'd like to talk through that a little bit and just kind of point out some of these things because I think that uh, this, uh, this article did a good job of kind of showing really the true effect of what COVID was doing. And, uh, and of course, it wasn't just COVID, right? It was all the things that came with that, uh, that came with the lockdown, that came with the, you know, kind of uh, divisiveness and, and political situations in the U.S. and, uh, you know, kind of the, all these different things that have gone out through all the years. So uh, at that time, and I, as far as I know, uh, none of these things have changed. And in fact, some of them have gotten more severe, uh, especially with the, uh, with the Delta variant. We kind of came out of it for a little bit and then went right back in. And I think that the people like myself believe that uh, this is going to be a long, this is going to have some long lasting effects. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's just important to know that as much as we're trying to open things up and kind of get back to normal life, that, uh, you know, there's still going to be some, uh, some, some kind of I guess, both positive and negative outcomes from this that, uh, again, that I'll talk about a little bit later. But I, I'm going to give you some statistics on this uh, to give you an idea. But, the, uh, you know, during this time, the economy uh, was considered a significant source of uh, stress for 70 percent of Americans, uh, which, is, uh, which is way up. The, uh, uh, and the government uh, response to that crisis was uh, almost again at 70 percent. Uh, a big one, and, and I will talk about this again a little bit later, but that only 50% of employees are comfortable discussing mental health issues, uh, either with their employees or with or employers or their coworkers, uh, which is something that, uh, that significantly affected people because they weren't, they didn't feel comfortable talking about it, so they weren't able to get help with it, and so it, it didn't seem to rate very high for employers as far as what their involvement needed to be. Um, the uh, there was, uh, in, in part of the survey, it said 18% uh, of people had experienced nervousness or anxiety most or all of the time. So it's 20% of the people feeling nervous or anxious, uh, you know, either most or all of the time. They have a, uh, a federal disaster hotline that was set up for mental health issues during all of this. And the volume on that hotline increased by over 1,000%. Uh, during this time, which just gives you an idea of kind of how people were affected and how significant that was. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously, people who were affected by other parts of it, people who were unemployed, uh, people who went through, uh, you know, marital issues and things like that during COVID, those people were greatly affected and even more so uh, along with those who had previous mental health conditions. And uh, the the long-term psychological consequences of this and the trauma and PTSD type uh, symptoms that are going to come from this are going to uh, be around for, you know, I, I would say that the, the general consensus is, is probably for another decade or so before we really are able to, to move past that. Uh, the, the pandemic did hit young people, uh, well, younger and older, kind of the, the, the middle-aged people uh, had a little bit less of a reaction, but Young people had a really severe reaction to it, and obviously old people, uh, the elderly, more so based on health than anything uh, for the elderly, but the, uh, I think for the, the younger folks, uh, they just didn't understand it and uh, you know, weren't even aware that something like this could happen like, like a lot of us weren't. Um, a couple other big ones is that 11% uh, of people said that they had had suicidal thoughts in the last uh, 30 days. That was up from like 3%. Uh, so that was really significant, and that's been another issue is uh, is kind of that type of despair and hopelessness that people uh, were and are feeling. And and then I think maybe the most uh, significant statistic that I saw was that uh, in June of 19 they did a uh, they did a survey, and at that point, 11% of Americans expressed uh, you know kind of an issue with depression or anxiety. And in December of 2020, that was 41%. So now we've got, you know, 40, over 40 percent of our country is, uh, is, is kind of expressing themselves as feeling depression or anxiety, which is, is well above kind of what the normal rates are. As you can see, it's, it's almost, you know, four times as much. And that just gives you an idea of how this uh, kind of affected us all. Uh, I'm, I'm also going to talk a little bit about kind of why, why this happened, you know. So why did COVID, uh, why did COVID kind of create this? Uh, increase in mental health. Some of it seems obvious, and you would think that that makes sense, that people's lives are changing, and there's a lot of worry, um, but there's some specific things that also went into that, uh, one of those being a, a really sharp increase in anxiety over health, 
uh, for all of us. And uh, that includes how we felt about family members and loved ones and parents and grandparents and, uh, you know, folks like that. It was a kind of the issue of health just became a bigger subject for us all. And uh, obviously, you know, we were asked to wear masks and stay home and, uh, you know, be careful and when grocery shopping and all those types of things. So just the the issue of health was kind of reverberating over and over and over again. And I think in general, we uh, we are all, you know, somewhat concerned about our health, but this just kind of took that over the top. Uh, and, and along with that, as I mentioned, is kind of the the fears that went along with that for the people that we cared about, the people that we loved and the people that were close to us. Uh, you know, all of us or most of us have, you know, some folks uh, later on in the years in our lives. And as this was moving forward, there was a lot of, uh, you know, obviously really bad health issues with that. Um, I think that the kind of uh, despair in general over kind of continuous bad news, it felt like the, uh, you know, with the news cycle, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, but it was just that was um, one of the things that the, you know, kind of bad news kept rolling in and people just kind of felt a general level of despair. Uh, and then I think a big one was for people kind of switching from living their lives to an idea of survival, where people were no longer just kind of navigating through the day-to-day -day operations, but people were starting to really feel like they were in a, you know, in a place where they needed to survive, whether that meant from a health standpoint, from a mental health standpoint, from a financial standpoint, uh, for employment, you know, all those things that we, we kind of switched into that survival mode. Uh, and any time you're in that, uh, it's, uh, you know, that increases anxiety and also can increase depression and, and things like that. Uh, the volatile market in job security, you know, it's well documented that the, uh, you know, a lot of people lost their jobs, the market took a huge crash, uh, and, uh, and since has rebounded, but at the time, uh, you know, that was a, a major factor. And there's still many people who are being affected by that. Uh, some of the different, you know, kind of areas of, of the economy have come back really strong, but there's still people who, many, many people out there whose uh, lives were significantly changed from a financial standpoint, uh, whether it was due to the, the market and the inability to kind of stay, uh, stay invested or reinvest. And uh, so some folks who had to pull out money once they, once it really dropped, and then also from an employment standpoint, uh, as you can see, if you, you know, if you, I live in Chicago, I go downtown Chicago and there's, uh, you know, stores and, and uh, Starbucks and places like that that are closing down all over the place. And, and, and some of those things just have never come back. So, and I'm not sure if they will. Uh, and then obviously the, you know, kind of the commercial real estate world uh, has been another one that, uh, that has been significantly impacted along with many others. Um, Another really big part of this, and, and you'll hear this kind of being talked, this will be a common thread throughout what I talk about today, but is just the social withdrawal and isolation. Uh, as human beings, we're not meant to kind of spend so much time uh, either by ourselves or just with a you know, small group of people. We're used to interacting. We're used to, uh, you know, kind of getting out there and talking to people. And one of the things that happens is uh, that you know, you may not have thought about or even noticed, but, you know, on, in, if you take a regular day where you would go into work and go into the office and, you know, kind of work your day and then come home, uh, there is many, many little social in interactions that you have, whether it's with a neighbor, uh, maybe it's with the person who works at the front desk, a store clerk, uh, somebody on the transportation system, whatever those are. And all of those things are really valuable for us so that we don't have a sense of isolation uh, and, uh, and ultimately a sense of loneliness. And because those things weren't built in uh, to our kind of normal day-to-day -day stuff, then we had to try to find ways to, uh, you know, to supplement that. And uh, that took the, you know, the, the form of Zoom calls and Zoom happy hours and things like that, which I think we were innovative and creative about doing. However, it doesn't really replace the human interaction. And so, that was a big, big thing that uh, that affected all of us, whether we knew it or not, is just kind of that isolation uh, and, uh, and not interacting with other folks. Uh, the, uh, you know, I think the, the other thing, the other big thing about this is, is that, uh, that quarantining makes it difficult to distract ourselves from, you know, kind of existing things in our lives that, uh, that may have been an issue in the past. And so, uh, we had, even if there were things that were bothering you in your life, you know, we were so busy, we were running to and from work and those with families were dealing with kids and, 
And uh, we really didn't have much time or ability to kind of even address those things internally. And I think that one of the things that this, uh, that, that this time period did is kind of forced us to do that. Um, so with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how kind of this affects each of us personally and, uh, and some things for, for all of you. And this isn't so much on a, on a social level, it's just it's internally. And uh, I think that uh, one big thing is, is that, and I kind of mentioned this before, but it, we just had to change our routine. Uh, kind of what we did on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis totally changed. Most of us were working from home. Uh, we weren't, you know, we were no longer going out to eat or getting coffee with friends or meeting up for a drink or any of those things. And so just our daily routine uh, was completely changed and kind of threw us out of whack and, and, and forced us to, uh, if we were going to address that, we had to be very uh, uh, intentional about that. Uh, I already uh, mentioned the isolation and the stress over work and money. Uh, but the, the another factor that came in here was uh you know, increase of previous challenges from mental health. And so, you know, as a country, we've got a, uh, a, you know, percentage of people in this country who have dealt with mental health issues previous to this. And w one of the things that we saw is during this time, uh, many of those people had a really, really difficult time with this. Uh, so there's kind of two schools of people that were affected on the mental health side. There's those who had uh, kind of existing conditions, uh, people who had already been through different things, whether that's depression, anxiety, uh, substance abuse, trauma, any of those things, people who had already, that was already a, a known uh, challenge in their life. And then there's a whole nother group of people, which was people who had never experienced any of this. They, they felt like, you know, they were pretty sound from a mental health standpoint. They didn't have much troubles with, uh, with uh, depression, anxiety, hopelessness, things like that. And during this time, that popped up. And I think that was particularly challenging for people because this was something new. Uh, the people who had been dealing with it previously at least knew, uh, you know, kind of what this felt like and, and even hopefully what they needed to do to try to combat it. But for the people who had never experienced it before, it was a, a new, strange feeling, something that they didn't totally understand. And uh, while you're, where you're already dealing with all these other things, then you have this kind of um, you know, kind of baseline of, uh, of how you're feeling, which has been affected. Um, and then, the, and then the last thing is, is I think that, uh, because of this situational, uh, because of this situationally, it, it, uh, left us with the, and I'll do a little exercise here, which might help with what I'm talking about, but it's kind of, uh, staying, we had difficulty staying out of our feelings and into our thoughts. And what I mean by that is it's kind of, uh, if you think of feelings as something that just kind of come and go and it's, you know, you might be happy or sad or scared or, or nervous or, you know, anxious or whatever. And thoughts are something that's like a directed kind of, kind of thought. And I'll, I'll, I'll do a little exercise here. You know, if you kind of, this is somewhat simplistic, but if you kind of break down the things we do as human beings into three areas of uh, actions, thoughts and feelings, uh, then what, uh, you know, if I said to each of you, I said, raise your right hand right now, and each of you went like this and, and raised your right hand, then we would have 100% control over being able to do that, and we would be able to make that decision to do that. Uh, the next thing is if I said to each of you, you know, think about, uh, think about the, the, the last vacation that you went on and kind of uh, try to try to go back and think about the, the, you know, the beach or wherever it was and just try to kind of have a directed thought towards that, uh, we would also be able to do that. Uh, we may not be able to stay in that space for forever, but we can, we have the ability to, to have directed thoughts and be able to kind of engage with the thought process if we want to do that. Uh, the last thing is feeling. And this is the thing that we have the least amount of control over. So for instance, if I told all of you, uh, listen, I want you to just be happier than you've ever been in your life. I want you to feel happier than you've ever been. I want you to be more excited and joyful. Uh, then typically speaking, we don't have the ability to do that. And if we did, then we would probably just all do it at all times. We would probably just decide that we're always going to be happy and we're always going to be full of joy and everything's going to be great. But we can't do that um, because ultimately we have very little control over our feelings. Uh, we do have the ability to affect our feelings. We, and that's usually through uh, kind of action and thought, the first two things I, 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 you know, I talked about. So for instance, if I'm feeling, uh, out of shape and, uh, and kind of, you know, kind of sloth-like, um, if I have that feeling about myself, then 
I could, you know, come up with a plan, a directive thought plan of how I'd like to change my diet and, you know, and, and, and eat better and exercise twice a day. And then I could take action on that and go do that. And so through thought and action, I could change my feelings, but uh, just wanting to change my feelings. I can't just decide, nope, I'm not going to feel out of shape anymore. I, I just feel like I'm in great shape. I'm, uh, you know, ready to go uh, run a triathlon. It doesn't, it, it does, feelings don't really work that way. And uh, so I said, the reason why I, I tell you about this and think it's important is because this is one of the things that has increased uh, dramatically during this whole time is that we have shifted more into feelings and, le and less into thought. And uh, feelings are important and it's important that we acknowledge them. It's important that we understand them. But at the end of the day, uh, if we spend a whole lot of time just trying to change the way we feel, meaning that if you wake up one morning and you're feeling depressed or you're feeling anxious and you just try really hard to not feel depressed or feel anxious, ultimately that's not going to work very well. Uh, that's where we need to get into thought and action. And this is one of the challenges that we've had during this time uh, because we, we had more time, we had more time to think, we had more self-awareness. And so a lot of that came in the form of feelings. Uh, and based on the fact that there was a lot of change and a lot of negative change, there was a, a kind of a, a, a higher number of negative feelings than we may have had in the past because of all these situational things. And so it's, uh, and, and I'll talk a, a little bit more later on about a, a couple of things related to this, but I think it's just important to know if you can take something out of today is just have the understanding that we don't have the ability to just change our feelings because we want to. Uh, and so if we're spending 90% of our time trying to change how we feel without taking action or thought behind it, then we're going to end up getting frustrated and we're probably not going to see much success in that. So, uh, the, uh, uh, the other thing I'll, I'll tell you about quickly is kind of what happens, particularly with anxiety from a, kind of a, a medical standpoint is uh, because anxiety was, you know, depression, and anxiety were the two biggest things that we saw here. Um, but, you know, essentially what happens is, is your, your brain, uh, when you're feeling anxiety or anxiousness, your brain kind of hijacks your, your frontal lobe and, and moves everything to your amygdala and moves it back into fight or flight. So that's what happens with anxiety is, is that we're, we're kind of moving from one, uh, one part of our, our head to another. And at that point, we kind of lose the ability to kind of have uh, conscious, rational, logical thought processes. Um, so that's kind of, uh, you know, kind of how that affected people personally. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about a little bit is, is how this, uh, this uh, you know, may have affected you guys with your clients and uh, kind of professionally, not so much just on a personal level, but professionally, because this is a big thing. I know that you're all client facing uh, folks. And so how you're dealing with those clients is important. And kind of what has happened here, I'm sure has increased the challenges with doing that. Uh, so I, I guess the one thing you can do is just understand that this is something that is out there. It's, it's, it's real, it's happening to people. And it doesn't necessarily, uh, it's, it's not necessarily linked to uh, whether somebody is intelligent or successful or attractive or any of those things that we, you know, place value on in our society, uh, this can, this can hit anybody, um, at any time. And, uh, and sometimes it's situational and sometimes biochemical, but, uh, you know, certainly, uh, during COVID, the, the situation, uh, has, has caused a lot of this, but I think that, uh, if, if, as people who are dealing with their clients kind of keep an eye out for people that might be struggling, not necessarily because you have to be the, uh, the, the person who solves their issues, but I think it'll help you deal with your clients a little bit better if you're, if you kind of have an inkling that there's something going on with them. Um, so some things to look for in your clients is to kind of see if they may be, you know, kind of experiencing some of these things. Well, if they seem, you know, it, it, and most of it's change, right? If you take the baseline of how they were in the past, if these were people you've worked with in the past, and, and what you're looking for is changes in some of these areas. And, uh, one of those would be stress. Uh, do they seem, you know, more stressed out. Do they seem like their 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 anxiety has increased? Uh, another one is that they become more demanding. Uh, one of the one of the things that happens when people feel like they're losing control of how they're feeling and kind of kind of what's going on with them is they become more demanding of others because they're kind of looking for answers. They're looking for solutions to something that they don't have the solution for. And so you may see that coming out. Uh, to you from your clients, whether they are more demanding, they're more stressed out, they're, they're, they're wanting more from you. And, uh, it can be, that can be difficult to deal with. But at the end of the day, 
uh, you know, that's probably not, uh, uh, well, it's not with all people. It's something that's actually built into the person. I know there's, everybody has difficult clients and there's certain people, but with those folks, you probably wouldn't notice much of a change. They were probably like that the whole time. Uh, other things to look for is somewhat uh, kind of erratic behavior or, or a change in their reliability. Um, you know, those things are, are you know, two things that, that definitely are affected where people who were typically showing up on time for meetings and things like that start either no showing or being late. Um, and then just, uh, you know, as I know that you, you, you all get to know your clients very well and, you know, your personal relationships with them. Uh, you know, you start to just see either from them telling you or you see it yourself, you see some different types of erratic behaviors. Uh, and, and one of those can come in the form of substance use. And, you know, that's something we haven't really talked about a lot, but we will, uh, is that, uh, you know, substance use and abuse is, is another thing that, uh, that has, has gone all over the board. I mean, in the, in the beginning of COVID, alcohol sales shot through the roof. Uh, there's been a, you know, a heavy increase in overdoses from substance use and abuse. There's been, uh, you know, higher levels of people seeking treatment, both at the residential treatment level, uh, also as, as, as an outpatient level. Um, so, and then there's, you know, a whole other slew of people that just probably drank too much uh, during this time. And maybe they don't have a serious issue with substances, but, uh, but it became uh, something that they abused over time. And, and you really have to be careful of that because it's sneaky. Substance use and abuse is sneaky and uh, you kind of feel like you have control over it and then it, it sneaks up on you and, and you end up in a place that uh, you don't feel good about. So those are, uh, you know, kind of some things to look out for with your clients and uh, some, some things that might uh, show up that would indicate that they're, uh, they are, you know, dealing with some sort of mental health stress, anxiety issues. Uh, and so I guess the question is, uh, you know, well, what do I, you know, what do I do with that, right? Like, so I've got the, I've got these folks, I figured out that there's, um, you know, uh, there's, <laughs> they're struggling with something. And I think that the, you know, what we really have to do is, uh, is be, you know, have, have very, um, I guess, a lot of understanding and patience with them. And uh, even though that's very difficult, but I know you're used to doing that because we, we all have to try to kind of be, uh, uh, you know, kind of congenial with our clients, even if they're bothering us. But if you have the ability to find some extra level of patience, uh, compassion, and understanding uh, in these times, then I think that will probably help your relationships with those folks because uh, they're kind of looking around for somebody, some area of support or, or understanding, and they don't know where that's going to come from. And I think as, as folks who are, are serving their different needs, uh, that's somebody, you know, you, like I said, you may not be able to fix, fix this issue, but if you can try to be understanding and compassionate towards whatever's going on with them, that will go a long way in building that relationship and, and, and having those, you know, kind of a longer lasting relationship where they're going to remember that when they were going through a tough time, uh, that the, you know, there's different folks who, who were very helpful and, and supportive and understanding and didn't, you know, kind of fire them as clients. And even if they did things that were, you know, maybe, uh, reasonable to, to do that with, uh, I think that, um, it's very difficult to do from, from your end, but I think it would be really helpful if you could just kind of go in and, uh, go in with that understanding that people might not have the same uh, ability to kind of work through these things as they might have in the past. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I would say just the, uh, a, a term that I like is kind of a reservoir of goodwill is, uh, you know, try to give people the benefit of the doubt, uh, realize that we have no idea what's going on in other people's lives. And, uh, you know, so that their actions aren't necessarily driven by them uh, just being bad people or, you know, being rude or being angry or whatever that, uh, Behind the scenes, there's all sorts of things we don't know about. And that's always been here. That's always been true. Uh, but I just think everything's on high alert these days and all of these things have increased. And so if you can, you know, kind of keep that reservoir of goodwill for the folks you're working with. And I would say everybody around you, I would say, you know, this, this holds true for your family and friends and, and, and everybody else. But, uh, certainly in the business world, uh, when dealing with, uh, with clients and customers, this is important, um, you know, to kind of maintain those good relationships and, uh, and, and hopefully they end up working through these things and they kind of get past it. But at the end of the day, uh, just feeling that support, compassion, reservoir of goodwill from you, uh, will be, uh, will be very valuable. And, uh, like I said, you never really know what's going on in somebody's life. We don't, we don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. And, uh, 
if we did, uh, you know, some of these folks will talk to you about it. They'll tell you what's going on, and then that makes it easier. But if you don't know, uh, just kind of assuming that we we don't know what we don't know and that uh, we can give them the benefit of the doubt will be, I think, very helpful for you. Uh, so uh, there, there may be questions around this. I'm happy to uh, take them, and, and we can also take them at the end. But I know dealing with science and uh, and such is something that's important. Uh, many times when I've, I've had these talks, that's been a, a key subject that people want to talk about. So uh, happy to more talk, talk more about that uh, if you like. Uh, so if we move on to another big factor during this time, uh, which I mentioned previously, but I'll talk a little bit more in depth, is about uh, uh, you know politics and the 24-hour news cycle. Uh, so one of the kind of studies that they did came out is, is that uh, watching television and specifically news uh, at some level became the third most time consuming thing that we did behind sleeping and working. So there was sleep, work, and then watching television. And uh, as most of you know, a lot of this was based around the news and kind of that 24 hour news cycle. And uh, as I mentioned before, a lot of the news that was coming out was not good news, uh, whether it was about the economy, whether it was about COVID, whether it was about the market, whether it was about you know civil unrest, whether whatever it was, whether it's about the divisiveness in our country and how you know we've got you know two very uh, you know um, different sides politically more so than we have in the past and, and which has been exacerbated during all this, um, and so just kind of that uh, that attention and uh, and time given to news and what's going on in the news. And if we start with the given idea that most of the news, especially during this time, hasn't been good news. And so if the, the news is getting worse and our attention to the news is increasing, then that becomes pretty obvious how that could affect us, uh, how it could affect you from uh, a mental health standpoint, how it could affect your mood, uh, you know, kind of all of those things. And, and one of the things we saw with the people that we, we work with, uh, as I, you know, that I see individually and things like that is, is that pretty much across the board, and, and we've got a wide range of folks, so we've got people with kind of severe mental health challenges, and we've got some people who are, uh, you know, just are, are um, you know, kind of the working well, who are just kind of navigating through a tough situation, or, you know, may have uh, just may just need somebody to kind of reach out to and talk to. And uh, I think that uh, across the board, we saw a general drop in mood uh, amongst people by probably, you know, 20-25%, uh, whether they were dealing with previous mental health issues, health issues or not. So, just kind of the overall mood has also been affected and the news and, and politics are uh, a big part of that. And so, uh, so I guess that, you know, the, the next question is, is okay, so we understand that all this is going on and we realize that we're all being affected by it. And uh, so what do I do about it, right? So, okay, so I've identified that, uh, that this is, is, is around me, whether it's with people I care about or in myself or my clients. And then, you know, we talked a little bit about what you can do with clients, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about what you can do personally for yourself or what you can help somebody else do if they're, if you're noticing that this is going on. Uh, one big uh, obvious one is, is obviously you can seek, you know, professional help. You can, uh, and it doesn't need to be with a therapist or, or it can be, you know, with, a, with, you know, there's a lot of different avenues. It can be a, a life coach. It can be a, a somebody within your religion. It can be, you know, there's different folks who are kind of qualified to talk through these things. Um, but so that's one thing is that that's always an option and, um, you know, it can be difficult to navigate through that and find the right people. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, if you do get with the right people, it can be really helpful. Um, but I think that the bigger things that we can do are, are things that we can do internally that may not even need uh, us to go out and, and seek treatment or help for it. Is, and, and that is that we just have to be really self-aware and open uh, and vulnerable about how we're doing. And, uh, and, you know, we will all pick who that's appropriate with and who we're comfortable doing that with. But it's, uh, you know, whether it's family or friends, I think that, uh, you know, we really, we, we need to be able to have those conversations and express ourselves because if you're holding all that in, if you're holding in kind of doom and gloom or anxiety and it's just kind of sitting inside you, then that, uh, that what we know about that is, is that's just going to, that's going to make things worse and that's going to continue to get worse and worse and worse. And so you need to find an outlet. You need to find an outlet for some of these feelings. You need to find an outlet for how you're doing. Um, and, uh, and, and so the first one I talked about is, is talking about it, whether it's with somebody professional or friends, family, but it's very difficult for a lot of us to be open 
and vulnerable and, and share feelings of things that feel might feel vulnerable or weak or, or whatever, you know, feelings we have about it. And I would just really uh, encourage you to do that um, because the, uh, the damage that can be done from not doing that, especially in really turbulent times, can be really significant and, uh, and may affect you moving forward. So uh, it's hard to do, but it will definitely help you. And, uh, and, and the, the longer term outcome will be much better. Um, so yeah, having these, uh, you know, honest and, and, and vulnerable conversations is really important. And then another big piece of this is self-care. Uh, self-care is a huge subject, which I'm sure all of you have heard people talk about before. And, and so, you know, we, we, we have to, you know, kind of pay mind to that, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's one thing to talk about saying we need to we need to have self care, but another one is what does that really mean? And so I'll give you some things that that, that kind of look like that. I think one thing uh, would be any way to slow down and do some sort of relaxing type uh, activities, and that could come in the form of meditation. Uh, many people have not tried meditating before. I wasn't a guy who really uh, meditated or, or even saw much value in it, to be honest. Uh, and so for me. Starting off on a guided meditation was easier for me than just trying to meditate. There's, you know, guided meditations that are out there on YouTube, on the internet. There's, there's apps that have free guided meditations on them, Headspace and places like that. So I think that, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's one way to do it. Um, uh, something that is, uh, you know, spiritually connected, whether it's through prayer or, you know, some sort of, you know, spirituality where you're kind of having a, a connection to whatever you believe in uh, can be very helpful. And then also reading uh, and reading can come in many forms. It can come in, you know, kind of things that you think might help you, but it can also come in just general fiction and, and things that are fun or, or reading the paper or, or whatever. Those are kind of relaxing activities that you can do. Um, I already mentioned staying connected to others. That is probably the single most important thing from self-care is uh, trying to avoid isolation and uh, and not reaching out to other people, it becomes very easy when you're working from home to not uh, kind of connect to others. And it's, I, I know I've said it several times on this call, but it's super, super important. And it has to be intentional because a lot of that built-in connection to others just isn't there uh, during these times or, you know, and it's changed a little bit, but it, we're still not back to a place where we're having as much interaction as we once did. Um, another big one is exercise. And I think that people sometimes think that to, that to have exercise be valuable, then it needs to be like a really hard workout or, uh, and of course that's helpful, right? If you, if you go for a run or, or do a class or, you know, go with lift weights or anything, those things are all very helpful. But even just getting out and going for a long walk, um, and, or even getting out and going for a short walk, all of those things are really, really helpful for us from your mental health standpoint and really important. And so I would encourage everybody, whatever level of exercise you want to go on. Uh, but if you think about it, like when you were, if, and I'm, I'm sure some of you are still going into the office or have all along, but if you think about the, just the amount of just physical exercise that you had on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, when you would actually go to work versus when you were, when you're working from home, uh, it's just a severe decrease of the amount of time that our body is moving. It's just easier to to, to stay in less motion when you're when you're working from home, and so that has been something that uh, that was affected, and that we need to kind of make sure that we're still kind of having as a part of things. Um, pay attention to your sleep and diet. Uh, these things are two really highly connected things to mental health, and so it's important that you get good, consistent sleep. Uh, and it's also important that you put good things in your body from a from a diet standpoint. And it doesn't mean you can't treat yourself every now and then. And, you know, have some things that you like, but for the most part, uh, it's a good idea to make sure that you're keeping an eye on that. Uh, I would also say maintain a routine on a daily basis. One of the things that we get out of during this is, is we lose the ability to stay in a routine. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, try to make sure you have a daily routine. Uh, another great way of self-care can be pets. Uh, it can be people have, you know, had a stronger connection to their, uh, their little companions during this time. And that can be really helpful. So if you are somebody who does that, it's something that's really um, valuable to you and uh, helpful for you. And I would say the, a, a really big one here is, and this is a big word that I could talk about for about 10 hours, but uh, is gratitude. It's the, the ability to uh, kind of get in touch with gratitude. There's a lot of different ways to do that. But one thing I'll say about it is, is the way that I personally define gratitude is the percentage of time I'm thinking about 
what I don't have and what needs to be different and what needs to be better in my life versus the percentage of time that I'm thinking about what I'm, what I'm fortunate to have, what I'm happy about, what is good in my life. And I think that if we have too much of a, a um, uh, if that's weighted too far on change, difference, negative, uh, then we need to adjust that. And I, I would say that that's one of the big things about mood that affects mood. Gratitude is one of the things that affects mood the most. And so if you need to, you know, if you, if you need to know how to do that, um, one way to start is, is to just kind of start intentionally thinking about the things that are good in your life and the things that you're grateful for and the things that mean something to you. So, uh, that can be, um, you know, something, uh, that could be helpful. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the longer term effects of what has happened for COVID. And there's been some really negative ones and there's been some really positive ones. And so even though COVID obviously has been a really tough time, the last 18, 20 months have been really difficult. Um, and there's been a bunch of negative things that have come out of it, but there's also some positive ones. I'll talk about the negative ones first so we can end uh, on the positive ones in a little better uh, and, and a little, I guess, more happy, happy place. But uh you know, these, and, and, you know, a lot of these I've already talked about, but we've got increased mental health issues, um, both those in people with previous mental health issues and those who have not. Uh, we've got uh, social anxiety. We've got people who are finding it more difficult to be around other people and kind of this back and forth between being stuck at home and, and out in, you know, meeting people and things like that. It's the change in that has been difficult for a lot of people and they're not used to socializing in the same way. And, and just like it was hard to move into uh, you know, kind of more isolation, it's also been hard for a lot of people to move back to normalcy. And, uh, and so there's a lot more social anxiety than there was before. Uh, for some, as mentioned before, there's been extreme, extreme financial uh, consequences to this time. And, uh, you know, people who had worked hard their entire life to set themselves up so that they could retire at a certain age or whatever, and they're unable to do that because of, you know, something that for the most part was out of their control. And so um, that's uh, obviously a negative consequence. Uh, another thing that has come out is that a lot of, uh, you know, troubled marriages and partnerships have been exposed. Uh, you know, sometimes if you're in a, in a, an unhealthy, uh, situation like that, you know, you go to work every day, you don't see them very often, you come home, spend an hour with them, and, uh, and you can kind of work through that on a day to day basis. But we've been forced to spend a lot of time with people and, uh, and really kind of, uh, be more transparent about how we spend our time and who we are as people, um, because it's, there's, there's, there's no way to, uh, do anything but be transparent because you're spending so much time with people, uh, particularly a partner. And, uh, so I think that there's, you know, some of the unhealthy marriages and, and people, you know, marriages that had some already underlying issues have been exposed. And so we've seen an increase in divorce and, and separations and things like that. Uh, and then another one is just kind of general family issues, uh, whether it's with kids, We've got a lot of people walking around that aren't feeling as good as they did before. Uh, there's more negative news. And so there's just been kind of this, this kind of negative negativity overhanging. And that has caused an increase in, you know, issues uh, within families and, and getting along and kind of operating in the day to day um, uh, operations of things. And uh, and then the last thing is, uh, and, and a really big one is, is that there has been a, a heavy, heavy increase in substance use and abuse. Um, and again, that's with people who had previous issues for the before, uh, along with people who had no issues with it, people who, you know, were kind of social drinkers and then they found themselves during this time just, uh, you know, kind of abusing, uh, abusing alcohol. So, um, you know, people use it. It's easy to get to when you're working from home, you start drinking earlier or whatever you use, smoking uh, marijuana, whatever people do. Uh, you know, it's a distraction from some of these things we've already been talking about, and then it's an escape. And uh, we just have to be really careful of it because it's, uh, it is, um, you know, I think uh, it's, a, it's a dangerous thing. Um, along with these kind of additional challenges, we're always on. We have trouble getting away from our work while we're living at home. Uh, we have, uh, you know, there's a, a change in the household duties where the kids, where, you know, who's, who's taking care of their schoolings, who's picking them up, who's teaching them at home, those types of things. Uh, separating work life from home life uh, is very difficult. You know, I think before we kind of go off to our job and then we come home and that was when we were at work and then we come home. And uh, I, I know a lot of people work after hours too, but uh, for the most part, we at least had a different uh, environment to do that in. And then there's going to be some long-term trauma and PTSD that we're going to see from this where uh, anytime we have a health care again, people are going to have a severe reaction to that. And we're even seeing it right now, this time of year, 
which is always somewhat difficult, but we're seeing that as we come into this time of year, you see that some people are, are kind of experiencing some of the older uh, feelings of things of, of during the shutdown as they realize they're not going to be able to spend as much time outside and things like that. So uh, I'll kind of quickly go over the positive outcomes and then we can take some questions. But there, there is a lot of positive outcomes from this. There's things that are going to change our world for the better and change us as human beings for the better. Um, one big one is uh, uh, increased awareness around mental health and substance use. I mean, you've got, uh, you know, thing, situations like Simone Biles and, 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 you know, kind of famous people coming out and talking about it. They, the subject is more talked about. People are more comfortable with it. More people are seeking help. Uh, it's just it, the stigma is is overall going down and people are getting more comfortable with it because this is something that whether we like it or not is going to be a major uh, issue within our society. Mental health is going to be something that we are always going to deal with and uh, we have to be able to take it head on and acknowledge it uh, and understand it for us to, to get better. Um, so I think that the, yeah, like I said, the increased comfort in discussing this and the, and the decrease in stigma. Another big thing is employers are paying attention to it and setting up programs or increasing their programs of how to help people who are dealing with mental health. Obviously, these employers spend all this time and money on trying to make sure that they've got uh, employee retention and things like that. And, and, uh, and mental health is a big reason why people, uh, you know, are unable to kind of stay consistent in their, in their duties. And so, uh, employers are listening and responding, which is, uh, which is fantastic. Um, another thing is more people have experienced this. There's a lot of people that had never experienced anything like this, as I talked about earlier. Um, more people are experiencing it. And uh, so that's just making the understanding across the board easier for people. So if I'm somebody who didn't really understand it before, uh, but then during this time I've experienced anxiety, depression, things like that. Now, when somebody talks to me about feeling that way, instead of saying, oh, yeah, just, you know, kind of just, you know, just try harder or whatever, uh, you know, what might have been said, uh, I would have a better, different understanding and compassion for it. And that's going to help us overall. Um, I think that there's also been an increased focus on overall health. Uh, both uh, mental and physical. I think people are more careful about their health, which is a good thing. Uh, we've had a lot of quality time with family, friends, and, and, and people like that. So we've gotten closer relationships. Uh, we've got the, uh, uh, an increased focus and self-awareness as, as to just kind of people checking in with themselves to say, how am I doing? And part of that was driven by not feeling good, but the fact that people are starting to become so more self-aware and aware of how they're doing and how they're feeling is important and, uh, and, a, and a good thing. And then I think that the final thing is just a better of understanding of who I am. Uh, this has forced us to really look at ourselves closer. Uh, and, uh, and, and a really important piece to that is, uh, is just being honest with yourself and then being really intentional on making any changes that need to be changed in your life, whether it's taking better care of yourself you know, keeping an eye on substance, substance use and, and, and mental health, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, trying to be more kind and compassionate to others, uh, any of those things. Uh, in, the word intentional is a really valuable one. Um, so I've got a, a, a number of other things I can talk about, but I think we're get, kind of pushing on the time here. So uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, you know, like I said, this is a really big subject. We could talk about this for hours, um, but hopefully I was able to give you some uh, you know, kind of a, a better understanding of this and some bullet points to kind of take with you that might help you personally or with your clients. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm always happy to, to help out in any way I can. If you have questions, um, you can feel free to ask them now, or uh, if you're not comfortable with that, you can, you know, shoot me an email or something. I'm happy to help out any way I can. Um, so with that, uh, I think that's what I have. And so uh, Pierce, if, uh, if there's questions or, or next steps, that'd be great. Uh, Derek, that was great. Um, I, I, it came to me when we were first talking as, as a uh, board about what we were going to talk about, is, and somebody brought this up, and it happened right about the same time mental health as an issue came up, right about the same time that uh, two things occurred just simultaneously. One, uh, Chapel Hill, UNC Chapel Hill canceled classes for a day because they had one or two people who committed suicide, so that's, that's got to tell you something you know, that they are having a real problem with it at Chapel Hill, because I don't know about you, but college was pretty fun, yeah. carefree yeah. for me. And apparently these kids are under a hell of a lot of stress. So uh, they uh -huh. felt like they had to cancel classes. Uh, the second thing is I've been on a couple of calls in industry circles with uh, people in the life insurance business. And apparently uh, mortality claims are up 20% uh, in 2020. And they didn't 
go into details, but I can imagine it's not all COVID. Some of it may be suicide. Some of it may be not pe people not taking care of themselves. I, I don't know what it is. It'll probably take years to figure it out. But apparently, it's all everything you've talked about is showing up in the statistics right now. So um, we appreciate your time. Appreciate you bringing this to our uh, our attention. That was great. Uh, I have to say, I went on your website and um, I love the quote you have from the movie Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, that everything will be all right in the end. If it's not all right, it's not the end. Uh -huh. So uh, <clears throat> I think those are sage words for all of us as far as gratitude and uh, being grateful for what we have. And, and when we get into a tough spot, know that, that it's not the end. So that's great. So thank you very much for that. And speaking of the end, uh, we're coming to the end of another year. And historically, what we do in this society is um, we do some charitable giving to various uh, groups who are less fortunate than we do over the holidays. Last year, we did a fill the Ford F1, uh, F450 pickup truck with canned food um, last year in December. It was absolutely overwhelming and the response was gratifying from all of our uh, people who are on the board, who are members and their companies. Uh, our board member, Fancy Worthington, who was in charge of it was a big hit. And uh, we were absolutely stunned with the response we got. So we're gonna do it again this year uh, we're going to probably beef up our fleet because we filled up the F-450 pretty quickly, uh, as big as it is. So we're going to we're going to have, uh, I think, a bigger fleet to handle the, the volume. So please watch for details uh, on your email. Uh, we're scheduled to do it on December 14th. So if um, if you're a member or even if you're not, check your emails and uh, think about a donation of some kind of canned goods or some non-perishable food item for the less fortunate people in our community who are a lot of whom are struggling during the uh, lockdown. So um, I don't see any questions. Uh, Janice, I don't see you see any. So um, in the absence of any questions, I'll give you guys uh, nine minutes of your day back. Well, thank you everybody. I appreciate you having me and uh, if any questions come up, uh, you can, uh, Pierce has my contact information. You're welcome to, to reach out. Like I said, there's a whole bunch of things that we weren't able to cover, but uh, so there may be questions, but I appreciate your time and thanks for having me. Thank, Thank you, Rebecca. Derek. Thanks a lot for the info. Thank you for listening to the Millennium Counseling Center podcast, where hope is yours, it's time to soar. Continue along your journey of healing, hope, and recovery with us next week. If you want to learn more about mental health, recovery, or if you just need someone to talk to, send us a message on Instagram or fill out the contact form on our website at millenniumhope.com. We are here to talk.